morning, everybody. Welcome to our service once again. Nice to have you with us uh, joining today. We have several people taking part and uh, they'll be coming up shortly. Hopefully two songs if we can uh, get those in as well. But we're going to just read the scriptures and pray. And, and today is a, a special day, the 17th of March, rather the 17th of May. I'm caught up in the, the changes of the month as well. The 17th of May this year is Sports Chaplaincy Day across the United Kingdom, never even further than that. And normally on this Sunday, I would be standing with a red nose, not because of any form of comic relief, but because I've just been to the Northwest 200 and got a bit sunburnt and wind beaten. Um, but it's not happening this year and a lot of sports aren't happening. But the work of sports chaplaincy goes on behind the scenes because people are still the same. In fact, lives are even maybe more complicated now. So we're going to just take a moment and remember the work of, of sports chaplaincy. And that's part of my role that God has given to me uh, as well. So let's pray. Lord, we come before you today and we thank you that you describe yourself as the one who is the God of all grace. And that's something we're going to learn about today. So we need your help and we pray the ministry of your word will be to us so rich and so real and appropriate to our own situation. We thank you that you are a God of grace, a gracious God. And we come today and we praise your name. We thank you that heaven praises your name. Lord, you've called us out of the darkest night of life and brought us into light, the rejoicing of your light. And we can stand before you as children of your grace, saved by grace, kept by grace, and one day meeting the God of grace, our Savior, Jesus Christ, face to face. Lord, forgive us if we have not, as your children, lived up to our gracious calling. And we pray that you would forgive us and help us to live up to that. We pray for those who are suffering today, those who are struggling still with the coronavirus, uh, either literally or the period that we find ourselves in because of it. We ask for your hope, your grace, your help in every way to those who need it. Those from our own congregation here in Newcastle and those further afield or those known to us and connected to us. Lord, we ask your blessing upon the work of sports chaplaincy. We thank you for those who have pioneered this and those who are asking for it and those who have been helped by it. And on this Sports Sunday, in one sense, we just ask that even though sport is silent at the moment, that your word that has been given out uh, and the presence of chaplains in various sporting arenas and sports clubs will be there. And what they've said, how they've lived, will be a great blessing to others and great glory being brought, we pray, to you. Lord, help us today, we pray. And we do remember those again who just need your help. We think of a young chap called Ben Johnson, a young junior doctor who's got COVID. We pray your protection upon him and upon his wife, Shannon, and family circle at this time. We pray for also God, Samantha Miller, that you'd help her recently on the loss of her, her dear mum. But we thank you that her mum is with you today. But we pray for Samantha and others like her grieving and suffering at this time. As we said at the start, you are the God of grace and we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. It's lovely to have you back online with us again this Sunday. We hope you're all well and that you've been able to enjoy the sunshine this week. This week, we're going to be learning what the Bible says about being still. So we thought we should do a little game together about being still, and it's called Musical Statues. So what you need to do is you need to find a space on the floor where you've got lots of space and stand up. And when the music plays, you have to move around the room and groove. And when the music stops, you have to be statue still. So do you think you could take part? We hope so. So up we get. Ready, Emily and Kate are ready to dance and do musical statues. Let's go. I'm a God is a great big God. My God is a great big God. And he's... Oh, statue still. Well done, boys and girls. Let's go again. Up you get, Emily. Oh, statue still. How are you getting on? We'll do it one more time. Let's see. 
Well done. That's a game you could play today later on uh, with your family. And I'm going to hand over to Sarah now, who's going to teach us all about this verse. Over to you, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, hello, boys and girls. Today, our memory verse is going to be taken from the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. And that reads, Be still and know that I am God. In this verse, God is asking us just to take some time to realise he is God, to be still and realise he is in control. Um, during this whole quarantine, I'm sure boys and girls, it's a wee bit scary. There may be a lot of confusing things going on that you don't understand. Maybe you might be worried about someone or asking God to keep them safe or to make them better if they're sick. But God is just asking us just not to worry, just to be still and realise he is God and he is in control. And now I'm sure boys and girls that because it's quarantine, maybe you've been spending a wee bit more time than normal, maybe on your phone or on your iPad or um, in front of the TV. But maybe instead, um, as an alternative, you could go out for a, a nice walk and look at the mountains or even just from your house, admire the beautiful sunset and to give thanks to God for all that he's, he's given us and all that he's done. Um, you can maybe even spend a bit of time looking over his word. And now, I know it can be a big task going through the Bible because the Bible is a big book, but I'm sure if you asked your mum and dad, they wouldn't mind uh, giving you a hand to go through and just read some of God's word and see what see what he has to tell us, um, just to give thanks to him. And even maybe if, um, even if you wanted, you could maybe sing some, sing some songs together with your family just as a, a bit of alternative to um, the things you might normally be doing during quarantine, or maybe you are doing that. Yes, so thank you for listening. Back to you, Rachel. That's great, Sarah. Thank you so much for teaching us all about that verse from the Bible today. We hope you boys and girls have listened in really well and enjoyed learning it too. Um, something you could do today is you could download our colouring sheet and it's got the memory verse on it. And then why not play a game with the memory verse today? And you could write it all out for the different words around the house and then you can try and find them. And when you get them all back together, you can try and put them in order and it'll just help us memorise the verse as well. I'm going to hand over to the Ferrises now who have chose their favourite song to sing to us. We hope you can join in singing and why not try out some of the actions too. Take care. Bye. My wrestling, in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are peace in my troubled sea. You are peace in my troubled sea. That you won't let go In the questions Your truth will hold And your great love Will lead me through You are the peace In my trouble sea Oh, you are the peace In my trouble sea My lighthouse My lighthouse Shine in the darkness I will follow you, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will have faith to show, faith to show, faith to show, faith to show. Good morning everyone. Our reading this morning is taken from 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 3 to 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. 
In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy for you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, as we turn to the scriptures this morning, we pray for the help of the Holy Spirit. We pray that we might have ears to hear what you have to say to us, minds to understand your truth, and hearts that increasingly rejoice in the Lord, the one who is our shepherd. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back, everybody. Lovely to have you with us again. Thanks to all those who took part already this morning, uh, to Rachel, to Sarah, to Bertie, and to all the, the fairest children as well. Uh, thank you. We're going to read two portions of Scripture. As many of you will know, we've been going through Psalm 23, and we're going to read Psalm 23, and then another portion in the New Testament from Romans chapter 5. Here's the word of God, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then over to the New Testament, to the book of Romans. And I'm going to read in where Paul is explaining about, about sin, about wrong and how someone has been made right, how someone can be made right. And he opens up in this way. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, speaking of Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. For the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. But the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. For if, because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that, as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
This is 2020. We all know that. I don't know about you, but I wonder if we were looking back from a future time, if we're spared to that, and we're asking, what was 2020 like? I think one of the things that I would say, not because of myself, but because of what I've heard, would be for many people, it was a boring time. People might ask who are not yet born in another generation, what on earth was there to do in those days of, of lockdown, of quietness? I want to take you to a little uh, journey just for a moment. The writer C.S. Lewis, we know him for many of his writings. Uh, we know him from the stories of, of Narnia, but he wrote also three books, a trilogy, a science fiction trilogy. And the first one was called Out of the Silent Planet. And it was written in 1938. Why was it called The Silent Planet? Called The Silent Planet because Lewis imagines all the other planets and all the stars in the solar system worshiping and singing to the God who was on the throne. But earth was found to be the place where there was no song. A man called John Phillips, writing in 1988 in a book that I came across uh, this week, um, told about the earth then, not directly related to, uh, to 1938, but John Phillips said, it's a bit like Lewis's silent earth, silent planet. And writing in 1988, John Phillips said, earth, well, it's quarantined. It's diseased. It's a sobbing planet. It's a rebel planet. Quarantined, diseased, sobbing, rebel, silent. That pretty much describes the world in 2020. How can we come to a psalm like David's in Psalm 23 and focus on three words, my cup overflows? And the way David writes this is a very positive way. It's an uplifting way. And yet if you take the picture we've just given of a silent planet, then how do you find that overflowing aspect to things when life doesn't seem to be going the way we would want it to go or life certainly isn't going the way we imagine it should go? David finds himself here, and some writers again, as we've been looking at this psalm, see David in the fields. And as he's in the fields, there are two of the men bringing a large urn of water, bubbling over at the top, two-handled urn that maybe only two people could carry. I remember being a, a baker a long time ago before he was called into the ministry, and quite often we had to bring in large milk cans of buttermilk uh, to do uh, the work in the bakery, baking bread. I imagine something like that was what David had in mind, if, of course, he's thinking of a situation literally out in the fields with the sheep. But he could be also thinking about the home situation. Last week, we took that, a never-ending supply of, of oil and a never-ending supply this week of, of wine. When someone was welcomed into the home, they were anointed with oil, they were welcomed, they were set apart, they had a special role, they were special guests, just as Jesus brings us in to his company. And I imagine David seeing that, seeing what God is doing, and bringing him into a presence with himself. Perhaps, like we said last week, the story of Absalom, his son, one of his sons who rebelled against him, and David went away. And yet there in the presence of other people, enemies, he sits down and has a meal, and it's not a rushed meal. But here we have the situation, my cup overflows. Now we can apply that to the Christian life, because the Bible tells us in so many ways that God gives us everything we need to be satisfied. I like the way Dale Ralph Davis put it, one of the writers and commentators on this psalm. He said it's all about this point, satisfaction with God. And God does give everything that the Christian needs to live the life, an abundant supply now and forever. For example, the Christian actually has, we may not always know it or see it or avail ourselves of it, but we have an abundant supply of joy, of peace, of forgiveness, of hope, of faith, 
of assurance, of love, of mercy, and of eternity. And it's all there. All there until the time when Jesus takes all of his people home. And as he said to his disciples in Matthew 26, I will no longer eat with you this bread and this wine of the Passover meal until the day that I eat it with you in heaven, in my kingdom that is eternal. And the way over in Revelation 19, the very last book of the Bible, John gives us a picture of that banquet that Jesus Christ will have with all of his people and for all of time. You see, God supplies richly everything we need to live this life. But there is one word that summarizes all of that giving, and it is the word grace. The word grace. And that's our focus just for a little while uh, as we move on through this. When we talk about grace, by the way, we've got to understand what we are talking about, what we're not talking about. So we're not talking about that prayer that often would have been heard and still is heard to some degree before a meal, let's say grace. And then you go down to your roast beef dinner or beans and toast or whatever it happens uh, to be. We're not talking about that in particular. We're also not talking about some form of ritual that is a grace ritual that we do something uh, and God, we believe, gives us something back in return. We're not talking about that either. We're not talking about a state that we find ourselves in a state of grace that we have earned or that we hope to be in or that others could maybe get us into. What we're talking about is that God gives us when we can't give him anything but ourselves and say, Lord, I am a sinner. I am wrong before you. That's all I have to offer. And God gives us everything we need. In Ephesians chapter 2, we're told, Paul writes to a church there, and he says, we are saved by grace. In other words, God gives this to us, not of works, nothing we can do because we'd only boast about that. He gives us the faith to believe, he brings us into his family, and he tells us that we are saved to God, for God, to be with God, to enjoy God, and we are saved by grace. And that continues through life itself. In Matthew chapter 28, when Jesus left his disciples, he said to them, and I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And that was the church age that we're still actually in. God has not left his people. And in heaven, well, grace will in one sense be needed no more because we will be worshiping the God of grace forever and ever. But I think when we come to Romans chapter 5, we get a most beautiful picture of the overflowing cup of God's wonderful and rich grace. The word grace appears a few times uh, in that passage that we read together. For example, um, in verse 15, the free gift that God gives is not like the trespass, not like the broken law. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more has the, or have the grace of God and the free gift by that grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded, overflowed for many. And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin. And on down it says this, for if because of that one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, and that one man was Adam, everyone dies and is spiritually dead to God, much more, says Paul, will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And on down in verse 20, he says this, Now the law was given, or the law came, to increase the trespass. It's a bit like the, the 30 mile an hour sign. When you're coming into the town, you see the 30. It's a legal, it's a law sign. And it says, don't go for 30 or you will break the law. And most of us have probably done that uh, a few times, unfortunately. And here God is saying, I have given the law, my standards, but you've bypassed them. You've gone faster through that sign period so that sin reigns in death. And Paul says, so that a sin reigned in death, 
grace also might reign through righteousness. In fact, he just says it a little bit before, where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Leads to that righteousness, the right standing before God, and it leads to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, there are people who imagine in life that that they can make their own cup, as it were, their own life overflow. If it is, it's nothing of grace. Grace is everything of God. But some people, for example, and you might be one of those tuning in today, uh, and I've heard this saying very recently and very often, your wealth is your health, or your health is your wealth, whatever way you want to put it. Good health, so we look after ourselves, that's good to do that. There's nothing wrong in doing that. It's a good thing to do. It's a good thing to get exercise. But if that's our sole purpose in life, let's face it, we're all aging and we're all going to die. So me looking after my physical body and even my mind is not enough with God, our Creator for whom we are made. Or it might be that you gain many things in life or you want to get many things in life. Uh, And there's a, a, I say the word with a small g, there's a gospel going out there that says we're meant to have as much as we can get in this life. I think that's a slur and that's not what grace is, by the way. It's not now that you're a Christian, you should be able to get as many things as you want. Abraham, that we're going to look at, just as an example, was one who was very rich Solomon was very rich, but they were very different. One walked with God and the other started well, disappeared for most of his life from God, and then finished well. Paul the Apostle, who was Saul of Tarsus, before that, when he was Saul, he was heading towards richness and greatness. But on coming to faith in Christ, he became poor. He writes to a young friend called Timothy at one time and says, Timothy, bring me the cloak Bring me the books, bring me the parchments. That's all he wanted. That was all he had. He was very poor and he was actually in jail at that particular time. And of course, if we could come to God and say, Lord, I want everything, I deserve everything because I'm now a follower of yours. Then what about those in what we call the third world countries? I have friends ministering out there to people who have nothing. Are they any less believers? in the Lord Jesus Christ because they have nothing? No, because it's got nothing to do with that at all. Other people believe they will fill their cup, their earthly cup, by knowledge. So they specialize in a subject or they study science or sport or the study of man, anthropology. And I think we've got to say we know far more now than we did a year ago or 10 years ago or 100 years ago or 2,000 years ago or 3,000 years ago when David was living, but do we really know much more? Last week, I asked you to read Romans. Romans tells us that we have exchanged the truth of God, sent it away, suppressed the truth, pushed it down for a lie that we have brought in. Maybe your knowledge is something you're quite proud of, and you're good at it. Well, commendation to you, but it doesn't hold any track with God. What about being at the top of your game, whatever that is? Well, there was a man who was at the top of his religious game in the Bible. His name was Nicodemus. There was a man who was at the top of his game in the 1994 World Cup. He was the Brazilian goalkeeper called Tafarel. And the difference between himself and many other players in that tournament, even in his own team, was a Tafarel, was a Christian. So 15 minutes or so after they'd won the World Cup and everything started to slide down and go down for the next few days, he was not depending on what he had received from man and the accolades. He was receiving what he had from God because he was living a life close to the Lord Jesus. Abraham. Abraham, we're told, who lived a long time before David, believed God. God gave him some promises, and he believed God. 
Abraham had a son that was promised to him. His name was Isaac. One day Isaac was, uh, or was taken as a sacrifice uh, or to be sacrificed to Mount Moriah, the same place, coincidentally, where Jerusalem is and probably the same place where Jesus died some hundreds of years later, well later in time. Uh, but that's, by the way, just for now. But Abraham believed that when he was going up there, he was coming back down there with his son and that God was going to provide a sacrifice. Why could he say that? How could he say that? When God had just asked him to sacrifice his own son. Well, I believe the answer is not found in the Old Testament. The answer is found in the New Testament. In John chapter 8, verse 56, where Jesus is dialoguing with people who were against him and against his way of thinking. And this is what these people who believed themselves to be heirs and in the family line of Abraham. Jesus said this, your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. Not the day of the Messiah coming, but your father Abraham rejoiced that he would say, see my day. And then Jesus went on to say he saw it and was glad, or he rejoiced, full of joy. His, his cup was overflowing hundreds of years before Jesus, as we knew him, came to the earth. I believe God in Christ was there with Abraham all those many years, even before David's time, and gave him a glimpse not only of the Messiah, but of Jesus Christ himself. And that's why Jesus went on in that same period, and he said, I am before Abraham was. I am before Abraham was. At that point, they wanted to kill him, but he, he was able to sneak out of the temple at that particular time. But Abraham was given that insight. So when things were asked of him in life, he could still go through with that overflowing cup because he knew he was right with God. Uh, not that terribly long ago in history, we celebrated 500 years of, of Martin Luther nailing 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Cathedral, which was the place where announcements uh, were put up and, and things like that. But we're not talking primarily about those 95 uh, theses that were put on the door, but Luther's own battle, because Luther had a battle going on in his own mind, and it was something along the lines of, how can a man be right with God? How can I be just before God? And he was struggling as he read through the book of Romans and he read about Abraham. And I want you to see Luther coming to God's word, searching, but his cup is not overflowing. It's empty and he can't get the filling of it. And then God speaks to him through this book. And God says to him, and I'm summarizing it very briefly, Trust in me. Trust in me alone, Martin Luther. And you will find that I will give to you the righteousness you need. And before me, you will be just because I have made you just. And when that truth dawned on Martin Luther, he tells us in his own writings that it was as if he was carried right into the gates of heaven itself and could understand things. And the Bible, he could see it from a totally different angle because God was speaking and he described himself as running through all the verses in the Bible with joy because his cup was now overflowing. And it was because he could do nothing but believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Whenever we read those words in Romans, speaking of Paul sharing the same message that Luther heard or read, talking about Abraham and the message that he had received, well, it's actually for us as well. Because that abundant grace or that super abundant grace, both words are there. Come to the person who comes to the Lord Jesus Christ 
and, and says absolute, Lord, I am sorry for the way that I have lived. John Newton was a man who was a, a slave dealer on the ships. He ended up as captain of a slave ship. He lived other aspects of his life far from God. And I know from some of his writings and reading about him that he wondered himself, how could he ever be right before God? Something that Luther had said as well. Something that maybe David had asked. But John Newton was brought to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus in the same way, just himself, a sinner coming and asking for forgiveness. And of all the things that John Newton did, and we're not uh, privy to them all, he wrote these words, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. It's no wonder he used the word amazing grace. You can read that hymn uh, for your yourself. But let me say, if you're listening to this this morning or you're watching, you, you don't normally come to church and you'll be afraid to and you'll be wondering, how could ever, or how could God ever accept me? How could people accept me after all that I have done? And you're thinking of that sin that's plaguing your conscience or that life that you've lived that you can't just get sorted. Let me say to you, the grace of God is super abundant to you. You see, the man who wrote this under God, Paul the Apostle, we're told of, his, of himself by God. He was the chief sinner. And he goes on to say that if God can save him, then he can save you too, because I'm the chief sinner. No sinner greater than me before God. And he's not saying it lightly, he's saying it for us. So if you're thinking to yourself this morning, that sin, that wrong, that broken promise, that wrecked relationship is keeping you back from God, then you come and you say sorry to the Lord and you will find the wonderful aspect of the overflowing grace of God. Just as Martin Luther did, just as John Newton did, just as David himself did, and perhaps just as Abraham did, who was a, a man who worshipped idols before he came to know the Lord. God helps in so many wonderful and amazing ways. God, uh, we're nearly out of time. I could have gone on to say that God fills our cup even when our cup feels actually empty. There's a, a lovely story of Don Carson, Dr. Don Carson's father, who was working in Quebec and the French speaking areas. And as he was there speaking, in 1960, some folks from America came. They'd been missionaries in the Belgian Congo, French speaking, where they were seeing great blessing, great help, great hope. Things were being built, crowds were coming to meetings, and they said, we'll go and help in Quebec, in the province in Canada. And they only lasted six months. Don Carson asked his father why. And he said, well, they're used to a lot of blessing and it's very slow up here and small. And Don Carson said to his dad, well, why don't you go out there? And Don Carson said that his father replied to him, the Lord says, I have many people in this city. A little bit from Acts chapter 18, verses 9 and 10 of great encouragement. And as that happened, Don Carson learned a great lesson. Here was a man who believed what God was saying believe what God was doing. And even though the cup was appearing to be empty, it was filled with peace and presence and help. You know, that can be your situation as well. You might feel empty in these days as a Christian. You're not. You're filled with the goodness and the grace of God. You might feel bored. You shouldn't be. God has given us so much to live the life in these silent planet days. Augustine of Hippo was a man who lived in 354 to 430. And in his confession, he simply said, Lord, you have made us for yourself, O Lord. And our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. 
Hebrews 10 tells us that we're to hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering because he who promised is faithful. I wonder when you look back on 2020, the silent year, will it be a year of nothing, boredom? Or will it be a year when you were filled to overflowing with the knowledge of the God of all grace who came into your life and filled your cup when everything else disappeared? It was just you and him, just the church and her master. Lord, we ask your blessing upon your word today. And we pray that you'll take it to all our hearts, whether we follow you or not, and you will speak into our lives that we might find the amazing grace of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 